Hello and a very warm welcome to this special edition of Rajya Sabha Television. Today, we look at the trade relationship between India and China. Historically, the two countries have traded for more than 2,000 years. Today, they are the two most populous countries in the world and also the fastest growing economies. All of which has immense implications for economic and diplomatic influence, not only in the neighborhood, but the entire world. India and China, two of the world's oldest civilizations, both took their first steps into modernity almost at the same time. Each shook off the chains of decades of imperial rule. The Republic of India and the People's Republic of China became independent nation-states in the middle of the 20th century. In no small measure, it was this fight against a colonial master that encouraged India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, to see China as a natural ally. China and India are geographically proximate, separated only by the formidable Himalayas. They share a common border along the mountain range, with Nepal and Bhutan acting as buffer states. They may be progressing at different speeds and capacities, but today, both nations are guided by the same vision of being recognized as rising powers. India and China are amongst the fastest growing economies. China progressed at 9 to 10% over three decades. India has maintained a rate of over 6%. What's more, their economic strengths are also complementary. China, strong in manufacturing and infrastructure. India, robust in services and information technology. If China has the hardware, India is supplying the software. The Chinese presence is pronounced in physical markets, while India is rooted in financial markets. Both are developing economies. However, there are specific strengths which both countries have. Now, one is obviously that uh, depending on the level of economic development in both countries, uh, trade takes a specific picture. The cultural and economic exchanges between India and China date back to ancient times. The Silk Route was the most famous trade route which also facilitated the propagation of Buddhism from India to East Asia. During the Second World War, both India and China, in their own ways, stalled the progress of Imperial Japan. The Mahabharat contains many references to China. The epic mentions the Kin state that later became the Kin dynasty. In his Arthashastra, Chanakya, the chief advisor of the Maurya rulers Chandragupt and Bimbisar, also refers to Chinese silk as Sinmasaka and Sinapatta. From the first century onwards, Buddhism travelled to China facilitating continuous exchange of scholars and monks. One of them was Hyun San, who studied mysticism and Buddhism in the Gupta period at the Nalanda University. In the modern era, Nehru devised an internationalist foreign policy. It was his vision of a resurgent Asia, based on the friendship between India and China. The 1954 Panchil Agreement with the People's Republic of China was also the time when the sentiment of Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai became current. It's a very, very long history when we are talking of, um, you know, over two centuries of history. Then um, there is clearly going to be a lot of things which would be very good, um, some which not so good and some which are rather, um, rather unfortunate episodes. So this is uh, this is, this is inevitable when you have two countries with such a long history. While cultural and economic exchanges were a prominent feature in the past, border dispute is more common in contemporary India and China. Both the countries have had three major military conflicts, starting with the indo sino War of 1962, the Chola Incident of 1967 and the skirmishes of 1987. And border dispute is not the only problem. Tibet is the key source of tension between India and China. At the heart of the boundary dispute is the Mohan line. 
It is effectively the border for the two nations, although China vigorously disputes its legal status. In October 1962, unable to reach political accommodation along the 3,225-kilometer-long Himalayan border, China launched simultaneous offensives in Ladakh and across the MacMohan Line. The war ended in November 1962 when China declared a ceasefire. The celebrated refrain of Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai became the derisive Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai. Until date, Arunachal Pradesh remains a potential conflict zone for the two nations. To their credit, and I think this is where we have to acknowledge the kind of political determination shown by then Prime Minister Narasimha Rao and Chinese President Zhang Zemin in the early 90s, when both sides came to what I would call as a very clear high-level political decision that no matter and notwithstanding the fact that the border and territorial issues remain unresolved, neither side will allow their militaries to fire a shot in anger. And I think that's a remarkable achievement that from 1993 to where we are now in 2014, despite all the unease, all the turbulence, and I would say that what happened in 2013 April in Debsang is a good example of how a situation can escalate. But yet, I think this peace and tranquility has held. Time for a short break. Lots more when we return. Amid all these tensions, one unabiding pillar for rapprochement between India and China is bilateral trade. Bilateral trade has overtaken political confidence building measures. It has changed mutual perceptions and contributed to overall tranquility. Today, China and India are Asia's two most dynamic societies. They are the new trendsetters in international relations. In the last two or three decades, both have effected major transitions in their economic policies those times there were only 300 or 400 families but now the numbers have gone to more than 40,000 in, in, in China. That shows that the, the process of engagement has been very positive but a lot needs to be done. There is still some level of communication deficit, there is still some level of trust deficit and I think that the more engagement process which happens, the more people to poor people contact happens, the more exchange of business delegations between the two countries happen, that aspect will be addressed. Economic liberalization has integrated them with the world economy. They no longer merely receive foreign direct investment, but have become investors themselves. From a trade uh, kind of a story, it is going to change into an investment kind of story. And that's the way we all believe it's going to go, it is going to go ahead. And there are many areas that uh, we probably could engage the Chinese well with especially in the areas that we need them to take on, could be infrastructure, could be things like solar power plants and things like that, where they have shown and demonstrated expertise. We get their companies to invest and manufacture in India. I think that would be the next big move that we will see. They can also bring back those goods which they can produce uh, better and cheaper in India. Uh, we should focus on bringing Chinese into India for industries and manufacturing. In the last decade, Sino-Indian trade has taken a quantum leap. Starting with $2 billion in 2000 and 2001, it grew to $73.9 billion in 2011 and about $80 billion in 2012. So much so that today, China is India's largest trading partner and India, in turn, is among China's top 10 trading partners. In both countries, leaders are confident that trade will grow up to $100 billion by 2015. Chinese companies have invested up to $53 billion in India. Big industrial houses in Mumbai and Shanghai and other centers have reaped the advantages of this relationship. 
Indian companies secured high value equipment in power, telecom and manufacturing sectors at competitive prices. They are now even raising commercial loans at favorable rates in China. Chinese businesses are increasingly keen to invest in India's infrastructure and also its consumer markets. The last 10 years, the Indian companies have been sourcing just like any other global companies out of China. But uh, in the last uh, recent years, that competitiveness is reducing because of the rising costs in China. So Chinese companies are looking at India as an investment op opportunity. And there is a good investment opportunity by Chinese auto companies into India. Uh, however, the enablers are one is uh, very uh, customer friendly policies, if you can make it easier for them to go set up shop there. There is a lot to learn from China. The Chinese companies are very keen to come to India now because that the Chinese infrastructure has now matured and they would like to invest in India and build ports, railways, high speeds in uh, India. I think now India needs that very badly. We need to take the advantage and that's very important. Time for another quick break. Lots more on the other side. As India's trade with China increases, there are many bilateral issues that are begging close scrutiny. India's trade deficit with China is ballooning and so is its trade gap with the rest of the world. How to maintain the present trade relationship while containing the trade deficit is a big challenge. Increasing diplomatic visits have served to cement the trade. This May, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi came as the Special Envoy President Xi Jinping. He met External Affairs Minister Sushma Suraj to establish political contacts with the new government. In June, Indian Vice President Hamid Ansari went to China for a five-day visit at an invitation he received last year to commemorate the 60th anniversary of Panchi. Also part of the visit were discussions on a wide range of bilateral issues. Commerce and Industry Minister Nirmala Sitaraman and a high-level delegation were also part of the entourage. Ansari voiced major causes of concern in bilateral relations. The serious imbalance in trade tilted heavily in favour of China. Look, our trade is very big, but there is such an imbalance that it can't be done in this way. Now, there are two ways. One is that we increase our export, or that we increase our investment in our country. So, the response of their response was that there are some things that they want to study. There are some complicated subjects, technical subjects. There will be talk about expert level. The bilateral trade totaled $65.47 billion in 2013, with trade deficit mounting to $31.42 billion. In 2013, China exported goods worth $48.44 billion to India, while India exported $17.03 billion, barely one-third of this figure. Today, Chinese manufacturers have access to even sensitive Indian sectors like power and telecom. Indians, in contrast, haven't made much headway into Chinese terrain. This asymmetry is reflected in nearly 50% of India's current account deficit. India is trying to remove procedural bottlenecks in trade, including time-consuming licensing procedures that Indian drugs and pharmaceutical companies often face. So we're working to see how we can address this aspect of large trade deficit. How can we diversify and expand economic and commercial engagement with NATO countries? How do we ensure better access for Indian products which are competitive to Chinese market? How do we facilitate two-way investment flows? Investment by Chinese company into India and by Indian companies into China. In short, we are looking at uh, expanding our economic engagement, which is already quite substantial in a most ambitious manner. The Indian government wants greater market access in China 
to reduce the trade gap. Prime Minister Narendra Modi says China will always be a priority in India's foreign policy. He has also reiterated India's resolve to use the full potential of its strategic and cooperative partnership with China. In fact, India and China signed three landmark pacts in June this year. In the presence of visiting Indian Vice President Harman Ansari to China and his Chinese counterpart Li Yunchao, the Memorandum of Understanding on Industrial Parks was signed by Foreign Secretary Sujata Singh and Chinese Vice Minister, Ministry of Commerce Gao Yen. The MOU aims at attracting Chinese investments in India and provide an enabling framework for Chinese companies to invest in industrial parks and zones. Authorized by the Ambassador of India to China, Ashok K. Kant and Chinese Vice Minister, Ministry of Water Resources, the other agreement envisions implementation plan for information exchange on Brahmaputra River in flood season. The third concord was endorsed by Indian Ambassador and Feng Jun, Executive Vice President of China Executive Leadership Academy for capacity building of public officials. With a very serious consciousness, that uh, there is a big trade imbalance at the moment. We hope to correct the imbalance by getting greater market access into China and also inviting China to invest in India. So that imbalance which has been prevailed, uh, prevailing in the last few years and which is huge, we certainly want the Chinese to look at investing in India or giving us greater market access. However, the Indian government has allayed the fears of Indian manufacturers facing the heat of cheap Chinese imports and reiterated that competitive advantage would be the foothold of strengthened Indo-Sino bilateral trade ties. When foreign investment ko invite karte in India, they invite some reasons for some reason. Or they are taking technology, or they are our manufacturing sector. Ko strengthen kar rahe so we think that the Chinese investment will also come with advantages. Ke Many feel that India and China are at the threshold of new era of cooperation, especially in trade, given the economic agenda of the new government of India. Modi visited China four times as Chief Minister of Gujarat, scouting for Chinese investments. In fact, much of China's $900 million investments are in Gujarat. In both countries, there can be a lot of vapor. In addition, there are so many costs that you can do with America, from Europe, from Africa, and you should increase the cost of cross-border investments. And this is a very good time when you invite the Chinese investment in India. Because China is going to invest in India, and they are going to have a lot of investment in India. Because China is going to invest in India, and they are going to have a lot of investment in India. They are going to have a lot of investment. वो अफ्रीका जा रहे हैं, दक्षिण अमेरिका जा रहे हैं, वियतनाम से छोड़े छोड़े देशों में जा रहे हैं। Things are changing, a lot more to be done in terms of how you encourage the Chinese companies to come in. But in the foreseeable future, you will see a lot of these companies are looking at Indian market much more seriously. In the past, diplomatic and security establishments have undermined the attempts to move the conversation beyond borders, visas and historic suspicions. But in these changing times, among all the large emerging economies like Brazil, Russia and Indonesia, it is the rise of China and India, popularly known as Chinda, that's considered the new world order in making. The new government has brought Chinese companies a lot of confidence and what we can see now is in the last two months, uh, we have witnessed at least 50 new Chinese companies who, who approached us for the, for the uh, consulting of doing business here. And uh, I'm sure in the next one year, there will be more and more Chinese companies coming. Indeed. If trade flows are the yardstick to assess the durability of economic relations, then China and India have some very busy and quite fruitful times ahead. And as the Indian Vice President put it, In front lies the ocean. Into that ocean of peace, my friends, let us launch our boats.
us pursue comprehensive economic, political and international engagement with New Delhi and it needs to buffer specific challenges and sources of friction like India's attempt to join UN Security Council as permanent member. How this relationship will play out in future, that will depend on a number of internal, bilateral, regional and global factors. Well, that's all. We get back for you in this edition. Thanks for watching and stay on with Rajasabha Television.